Right now, children are dismissed to Children's Church, and as they begin to make their way, please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 54. Psalm 54. Today we are kicking off a new sermon series. This series will last four weeks, and the name of this series is Thankful No Matter What. God tells us in His Word, in Colossians 3.17, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. God says in his word in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God tells us in Ephesians 5.20, give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. God expects us. God commands us. God desires us. It's God's will for us that we be thankful no matter what. And to that one may say, John, wait a second. What about when death knocks on the door of my loved one? What about when my marriage is strained? What about when my job is blah, or it's difficult, or I lose my job? What about when my kids won't listen to me, or my parents don't get me? What about when Mother's Day, for some, is more hurtful than joyful? What about when sickness overruns me, or my friends leave me, or fellow Christians are acting as they shouldn't, and the ministry is hard? What about when my failures and shortcomings just seem like they're piling and piling and piling on top of one another? How can God expect me, desire of me, make it His will and His command for me with any sincerity to give thanks no matter what? Well, that's what this series That's the question this series that we're going to go through in God's Word is going to answer. Because in God's Word, He doesn't just tell us to be thankful no matter what. He gives us reason upon reason upon reason upon reason to be thankful no matter what. And it's my hope in this series that as a result of looking at this truth that the Holy Spirit will rip out of us will rip out of us any spirit of complaint, any spirit of bitterness, any spirit of divisiveness, of gossip, and he will fill in our hearts with a spirit of contagious, unrelenting thankfulness, like the thankfulness that he's called us to. And the first place we're going to turn is Psalm 54. If you, have, if you haven't turned there, turn there now. Psalm 54 is written by David, and Psalm 54 has three parts. Three parts. David's call, David's confidence, and David's choice. David's call, David's confidence, and David's choice. And in these three parts, what are we going to see? We're going to see abounding reason for you and I, no matter what, to be thankful. Abounding reason. Let's look at the first part, David's call in verses 1 through 3. Look at verse 1 of chapter 54 of Psalms. It reads, O God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. O God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. David is calling out to God for salvation and vindication. Why? Look at verse 3. For strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. 
Who are these strangers that have set themselves up against David? Who are these ruthless men that are seeking his life, that don't seek after God? Who are they? What's the context of this? What's driving David to call out to God? Well, we find the context. We find the reason why he's calling out in the superscription of this passage, in the text before verse 1. Look at the text before verse 1. It says, To the choir master with the stringed instruments, a maskil of David, when the Ziphites went and told Saul, is not David hiding among us? That's the reason. That's the reason why he's calling out to God. That is the reason. And we need a little bit of, of backstory. Who are the Ziphites and what exactly did they do? Why is this causing David to call out to God in this manner? So let's look at who the Ziphites are. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23, starting in verse 1, reads, Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floors. So David here is getting news that the Israelites are being attacked, that the region of Keilah is being attacked, it's being robbed. And you have to remember David's position at this point when he gets this news. What is his position? He has been anointed as the future king of Israel. And that's a great and good thing. But as a result of that anointing, who's been chasing after him for years trying to kill him? The current king, King Saul. So he is not in a good position to rescue these people. There's a lot of risk involved. It would be very easy for him to say, I got my own problems. Take care of yourself, region of Kila, or better yet, call upon the current king. Get him off my back and have him start being the king he needs to be and rescue you. But look at what David does in verse 2. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack these Philistines? How selfless is that? How selfless is that? And what does God say to him? Look at the remainder of the verse. Verse 2, And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Kilia. And what does David and his men eventually do? Verse 5, 1 Samuel 23, and David and his men went to Kilia and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Kilia. He is the God-ordained hero of these people. How great is that? You don't think that's great? That is amazing. But look at the thanks that he gets. Look at the thanks he gets starting in verse 7. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Kilia, and Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself by entering a town that has gates and bars. Instead of being thankful unto God for the work that he did through David, he's seen it as a God-twisted opportunity to capture David and kill David. Imagine being David. How would that make you feel? You've selflessly sacrificed yourself for these people, and now the current king who should have done that is seen it as an opportunity, a God-given opportunity, to kill you. And you know what? It gets even worse. David gets news that Saul is coming, and he's just rescued these people. And he's like, oh, these people will protect me? These people will stand up for me? And he goes to God and asks him, God, will these people protect me? Will these people stand up for me? And look at what God says, starting in verse 12. Then David said, Will the men of Kilia surrender me, he's talking to God, and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will surrender you. How frustrating. How hurtful is that? You've sacrificed your life for these people, David, and nope, when push comes to shove, they're going to throw you on the altar to Saul. They're going to give you up. They're going to betray you. And you know what? It gets worse than that. David leaves the region, and he goes to the region of Ziph. 
He's still a hero of the country. He is the one who destroyed Goliath and led all those battles. And here he's done another mighty rescue mission through the power of God. He goes to the region of Ziph that knows all of this. And what do these people do? Just as it said in the superscription of Psalm 54, look at verse 19 of 1 Samuel chapter 23. Verse 19, it says, Then the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding among us? Is not David hiding among us? At Horesh, on the hill of Achilla, which is south of Jismon? David is the rightful future king of Israel. David has been betrayed before, and here he's being betrayed again. He's been chased for years by King Saul, unjustly, as a fugitive to the state. If anyone at this point in time had a reason, had a truckload of reasons to be down and out, or a truckload of reasons to complain or be bitter about, it was Daniel. This is all unjust. But in this situation, what does Daniel, or excuse me, David, we got out of the series of Daniel, what does David do? We go to Psalm 54, and we see exactly what he does. He doesn't complain. He doesn't let his hurt fester into bitterness or resentment. He doesn't gossip. What does he do? In verses 1 through 3, he calls out to God. He goes to the Lord in prayer. And here is the first reason that we see that you and I can be thankful no matter what. Here is where we see the first reason why you and I can be thankful in all things. David was a sinful speck of human on a blue dot in the midst of a massive universe. Yes, he selflessly rescued the people of Kilia, but he was not a perfect individual by any means. After this, he's going to have an affair with Bathsheba. He's going to murder Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, and then he's going to take a census. A census to bolster his own pride that leads to the death of 70,000 people. That's Eaton Rapids, within the city limits, slaughtered 20 times over. He's not a perfect person. He's a sinful person that makes mistakes constantly, like you and me. But in this situation of need, what is he able to do? Because God is so gracious and he trusts in him. In this, he can call out to God. He's not alone. The phrase, I'm alone, I'm facing this on my own, I'm doing this by myself, those are all phrases he does not ever have to use, nor do you and I. Why? Because we always, through Jesus Christ, have the opportunity to do what David is doing here. Call out to God in prayer. Thanks be to God, amen? amen. Fifteen years ago, I was engaged to a girl whose name was not Kimberly. Not my wife. And obviously the engagement broke off. And the wedding didn't happen. And it was not pretty. It was messy. I'm so thankful now that it ended. That it broke up. But... When it happened, I was hurt and I was confused. But let me tell you something. I was never alone. Happened right out, right after college lets out, lets out, all my friends are gone to their different states. They're not around. Family's not around. They went on a month and a half vacation and left me behind, some family. <laughs> I'm alone in the house by myself for a month and a half. But I was never alone because every night I was able to go on the roof of the house and call out to the God who hears you and me. 
in every circumstance, you and I have reason to be thankful. We have reason to be thankful. So often we treat prayer as something trite, a formality during a service, or something we have to do. But prayer is a perpetual reason for thanksgiving. We have reason to be thankful in all things. Now look at verse 4. The text shifts. It goes from David's call to David's confidence. Look at verse 4. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. It's Mother's Day, so I'm going to tell you a few things about my mother, and you probably expected that. My mother, my mother helped me in school. She, she supported me in athletics. I needed a lot of support there. She was an incessant encouragement in my life, as every mother should be. And I am so thankful for her. But I want you to notice something. She was a pillar. She was an upholder in my life. But right now, she's not on this earth. She is absent from the body and present with the Lord. She is in heaven with God due her to her faith in Jesus Christ. That upholder, that helper in my life is no longer here, but I'm still standing, and I'm still going strong, and I'm still so full of hope. Why? Because at six years old, she led me to a helper greater than she could ever be. She led me to a person, a God, who would uphold me no matter what and never let me down. I have that confidence. And you also do too if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. That's a confidence that David has. He's been betrayed over and over. He's been hunted like a common criminal. Yet all of it, it doesn't put a dent in his confidence. Because his confidence isn't in the people of this earth. His confidence isn't in himself. It is in the ultimate helper, the ultimate upholder that never lets him down. He knows, as Psalms 18.2 says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my strength, my God in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. He knows, Exodus 15.2, the Lord is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him, my father's God and I will exalt him. He knows Psalms 23, 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That last phrase, they comfort me, could also be easily translated, they uphold me. You and I have thanks. We have the ability to give thanks no matter what. Why? Because not only do we have a God who we can call on, but we are calling upon a God who is the ultimate help, the upholder of our life, that will not let us down. Now look at verse 5. He continues in his confidence and he says, He, speaking of God, will return the evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness, put an end to to them. It's so interesting. After that whole event with the Ziphites occurs, what happens after that? David has an opportunity in 1 Samuel 24 to kill Saul. And he doesn't. In 1 Samuel 26, he has another opportunity to kill Saul. And he doesn't. In 1 Samuel 26, he has an opportunity to obliterate the Ziphites. When he becomes king, he has the power and the ability to slaughter the people of Killah who would not defend him even though he saved them. 
He has all of that. He has the ability to do all of that, yet he refuses every time. Why? Because he has confidence that God is just. That God is judge. And he will settle all accounts perfectly. He doesn't hold, have to hold on to bitterness or unforgiveness until he receives the apology that he deserves. He doesn't have to play God and say, I'm going to be the one that inflicts the punishment that you deserve. He's free from all of that. He doesn't have that burden anymore. Why? It's because of who God is. He's the one, as it says, who will return evil upon my enemies, will exercise that justice. He is faithful to put it to an end. Justice is happening. You and I can be free from the burden of being vengeful, of playing God. As it says in Romans chapter 12, 19, Beloved, never avenge yourself. There's no need to bear that responsibility. We can forgive immediately. That beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. When we're overwhelmed by the hurt that's being thrust towards us, or we're overwhelmed by the general depravity of the world, and we don't see how justice is going to come into play, we can still have confidence because He is going to exercise justice. That's a reason to give thanks unto God. That's a reason, no matter what we see, to praise him because we know that he's going to settle all accounts perfectly in the end. It will all be made fair. Absolutely fair. That is a reason to give thanks to God no matter what. What in your life is unfair? Who's the person? What's the situation? God's going to settle accounts. He's going to make it right. We don't have to settle the account. We're free from that. What amazing, amazing God we serve. Now look at verse 6. The text shifts again. In verses 1 through 3, we see David's call. In verses 4 and 5, we see David's confidence. And in verses 6 and 7, we see David's choice. He makes a choice. Look at verse 6. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name. Notice two things here. First, notice that David is not bribing or bargaining with God. He is not saying, I'll give you thanks so you solve my situation the way I want you to. Or vice versa. He's not saying, solve my situation and I'll give you thanks. He's not bargaining. He's not bribing God with his thankfulness. He's making a choice. He's making a choice to be thankful no matter what. He's saying, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name. It's a no matter what, no ands, if, or buts choice to be thankful. That's you and I getting cancer and saying, God, whether you heal me immediately or you cause me to go through 20 years of chemo or you take me before anyone expects, I will give you thanks. That's you or I losing our job and saying, God, whether you provide another job immediately you cause me to wait till I'm at my last dollar in my bank account, or you make me go on welfare. I will give you thanks. I will make that choice. It's saying, he's saying, God, if there's hurt in my life, someone that's against me, and even before they apologize, even before I know it's how it's going to work out, I will give you thanks. That's what's going on here. He's been betrayed, he's been betrayed, he's being chased, and it's not over, and he's making a choice. He's making a choice. He's saying, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to you. So first we notice in verse 6, 
that he makes a choice to give thanks no matter what. Second, we see the reason why he gives thanks no matter what. What's the reason why in verse 6? Look at verse 6. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. If I were to say to you that you have a horrible or a bad reputation in this community, what would that mean? That would mean that this community doesn't respect you, that it doesn't trust you. If I were to say you have a great, you have a good name in this community, what does that mean? That means this community respects you. That means this community trusts you. And a similar thing is going on here. The reason David is able to give thanks in the midst of of his suffering is because he knows God's good name. That his character every time, all the time, is flawless. That he always does the right thing, the right way, at the right time, every single time. He knows the name. He knows the reputation. He knows who God is. So in the midst of his suffering, he's able to thank God no matter what. What? And how does he know the reputation of God? How did he get to this point? Well, first, he's a man of God's word. The scripture written up to this point, he treasured it in his heart. He knew it. He saw the faithfulness, the trust, the respect God deserved in every situation through God's word, and he experienced it himself. Look at verse 7. Look at his experience in trusting in God and thanking him no matter what. Look at verse 7. For he has delivered me from every trouble. And my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. When David faced Goliath, did God deliver him? Yes. When David needed a friend, a close confidant, did God provide? Yes, he provided Jonathan. When David incessantly needed rescue from Saul, did God provide? Yes, he did every single time. Every time. He can give thanks to God no matter what. Not only because he's seen who God is in his word, but he's experienced who God is. That he does the right thing in the right way at the right time every single time. And this is not just David's experience. This is your and my experience if we believe in Jesus Christ. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, what happened? The punishment for all of our sin, death and hell for all of eternity, what happened to it? It was nailed to the cross! And we have hope of heaven forevermore. Based on that, we can thank God no matter what. When we placed our faith in Jesus Christ, what happened? We all were pathetically trying to live the right way without the Holy Spirit, and He gave us the Holy Spirit and the ability to face and do what is righteous in every single situation. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, what can we say to death? We can say, death, where is your sting? You're just a gateway to the presence of God in every situation. Like you and I, we have seen in God's word his name, that he's trustworthy, that we can thank him no matter what, and we know from our own experience that God is trustworthy, and we can thank him in everything and know beyond the shadow of a doubt that he is working every single detail all together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Three applications to this message. First application, if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ and you're looking for the ability to be thankful no matter what, Jesus Christ is where that's at. Believe in Jesus Christ that he's the son of God that came to this earth, died on the cross and rose again. And you will receive the ability to be thankful no matter what because you know everything in your life Everything is going to work together for good. 
That's the first application. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ and you're looking for reason to be thankful no matter what, believe in Jesus Christ. Second application. Confess. Let's confess our lack of thankfulness. These are not suggestions. These are not recommendations. These are not good ideas. These are commands. It is the command of God that we be thankful. He says, give thanks, not, hey, it's a good idea, maybe you want to. He says, give thanks always for everything. It's a command. It's his desire. It's his will. And when we don't obey his command, when we don't fulfill his desire, when we fall short of the glory of God, what is that called? That is called sin. Ungratefulness is a sin. So what do we do with sin? We don't dwell within it. We forsake it. We confess it. We abandon it. We say, God, forgive me and help me to move out of that mindset. It's so easy, isn't it? To fall into a mindset of, unthankfulness so easy to complain it's so easy to be divisive it's so easy to gossip but God hasn't called us to that he's called us to something greater he's called us to something better he's called us to give thanks no matter what to give him the glory in all things First application, if you're looking for reason to be thankful, trust in Jesus Christ. Second application, let's confess any area of our life where we are not exercising thankfulness. Third application, give thanks for your greatest struggle. What is your greatest hurt? What is mine? What is your greatest pain? What is mine? I challenge you as I challenge myself to thank God for it. God knows about it. God's sovereign over it. And what is God doing with it? He's working all of it together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And if he's taking our greatest pain and he's working it together for good, that's reason to give thanks for it. Say, God, you're molding me, you're shaping me, you're allowing me to go through this so I can be who you want me to be. I challenge you as well as I challenge myself. What's your greatest pain? And thank God for it. And experience the power of doing that. Experience the joy of doing what you and I are called to do. Give thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Last application, it's share thanks. Share thanks. What do I mean by that? I mean that in this world, every day there's a new disaster, isn't there? Every day there's a new hurt. Every day there's a new complaint. Every day there's a new crisis. Every day there's a new insane idea. Every single day. This world is so desperate. So desperate for reason to give thanks no matter what. They're so earnest and wanting and in need of it. So what do we need to do? We need to share the secret to thankfulness no matter what. How dare we look at a person who doesn't have Jesus Christ and say, screw you. I don't care. What about me? Let's share the secret to thankfulness. That's what this is all about. That's what us getting together, making some booze, doing a concert, this is, that's what this is all about. This is all about God saying, I'm so thankful for all that you've done. No matter what, I want others to experience my thankfulness. I so encourage you. I so encourage you to participate in this. I so encourage you to do that. Wouldn't it be fantastic? This whole room, we're all at the field of dreams proclaiming the thankfulness that we have for God and saying, hey, join us in thankfulness. How powerful, how encouraging would that not only be for them, but for us? Thank you. (laughs) 
You know this. I know you know this. And it's time to move. It's time to move and say, we have this ability to be thankful no matter what. Let's share it with someone else, and let's do it as a big, massive group. It's hard to evangelize evangelize one-on-one. That's pretty difficult. But if we were to be 200 strong, how great would that be? How amazing would that be? How thankful we could be? Our God is so good. We have reason no matter what, as we've seen throughout this psalm, through David's call, through David's confidence, through David's choice, that we can make the same choice and be thankful no matter what. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for Psalm 54. Thank you so much for the example of thankfulness no matter what. And dear God, I thank you for the elements that we're about to partake in in communion. What are they? They're yet another reason to give you thanks no matter what. You've given us hope and a Savior a Savior, your Son, named Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us who are unworthy. Dear God, we thank You for that. What an amazing truth. What a powerful truth. What a life-changing truth. What a truth worth sharing. Dear God, You are so good. You are so good. We sing... We glorify, we give you all the honor, we give you all the thanks that you deserve. I pray, Lord, as we approach this table in which we celebrate, sounds weird, but we celebrate the death of your son because through his death we have victory, you would encourage us today. You would encourage us and lift us up and enable us to follow and do what you want us and be who you want us to be, a thankful people an incessantly, contagiously thankful people. We pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.